great things. And I want to talk today on the subject, when the devil leaves. When the devil leaves. Praise God. Amen. Amen. In each, in each of our lives, we will all go through times of suffering. And most of the time, those times of suffering are just life. And, and any time I have a chance to take away someone's suffering, which is rare, I will do that. Parents will do that for your kids. You want to take away the suffering. You want to help them not feel bad. You want to touch the skin and knee with healing and balm and a band-aid. You want to feed them the food that they are hungry for. You want to give them the love that they need and affection. You do this if you love your spouse, you do the same for your spouse that you do for your kids. You love your wife, you love your husband, you give them uh, the strength that they need. You show them affection in times of suffering. Hopefully you do the same for your mom and your dad, your family members, your friends. You counsel them in times of suffering. You do the same thing for your body. Your body is attacked. Uh, and if your, your body is sick, you should treat it and give it the things that it needs. Give it some type of uh, fix, whatever the fix is. Nine times out of ten, that might just be sleep. Uh, but I'm a big believer in and uh, that when you're sick, do something to fix it. Uh, I take vitamins. I help my kids with vitamins. I just sent Zachary a big pack of them this week because he got COVID. And uh, he started taking them. He started feeling better the next day. I did what I could to help alleviate his suffering. Even though I'm 700, 650 miles away, I did what I could to alleviate his suffering. And uh, we, we want to help others. That's the best we can do. But there's sometimes... When uh, there isn't anything we can do to help somebody. And there's sometimes that you're going to go through things that no one can help you with. Um, different situations come in our lives and some of them can be fixed and some of them can be fixed. A lot of times uh, a husband that's married to someone who doesn't love the Lord the way that husband does. A wife that's married to someone who doesn't know Jesus. That's a long term in many situations, in most situations, it's a long-term problem. That's why, and most of the time, those are people that came to the Lord after they got married. But let me say to you, young people, it matters who you marry. The person you marry needs to love the Lord. Uh, that's not to place any kind of blame. Because like I said, most of the time, those are situations where the, the wife or the husband came to know Jesus in, the, in his fullness after they got married. That's a situation that can't easily be fixed without the hand of God. If there's an abusive situation, a lot of times that can't be fixed. And sometimes you got a family member that is bound up in their own uh, desire for drugs or alcohol or something that will hurt them. And there's nothing you can do to help them. The, the amount of money that you have, which may be better than what your kid has because you've been working longer, you may be able to extend a little help, but it's not enough in that situation. And sometimes there are attacks that come that are not like. They come from the enemy. The enemy desires to uh, destroy us. Jesus said Satan uh, wants to make you, Simon Peter, like flour. He wants to sift you as wheat, which up until the modern era, nowadays we use knives and industrial equipment, but if you've ever been to an old-fashioned mill, it's two stones rubbing together. That's what Satan wants to do to you, Peter. He wants to destroy you. And I want you to know that I can't take that away from you, Peter. Jesus said that to his own inner circle follower. We know Jesus had many followers, up to 500 at one time. He had 12, but then he had three, Peter, James, and John. He said, that I can't take it away from you, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail you not. Sometimes the enemy is going to attack. Sometimes the enemy is going to attack. It's going to happen. It doesn't mean that most of our problems are caused by the enemy. But when it is... A situation in our life, in my life, in your life, that has his paw prints or his hoof prints, if you want to think of him as, as what the old timers used to say, old sleuth foot. Maybe you've heard him called uh, Mephistopheles. Maybe you've heard him called these other things. I knew a man one time that named his dog old sleuth foot. Uh, I knew a man that named his dog Satan. And it was a Rottweiler. And it looked like Satan. And uh, I didn't, I tried to get near it, and I was young, and I extended my hand, and uh, that was a mistake. It didn't get bit off, but it almost got taken off. But uh, people, it, it, they, they see the evidence of 
bad situations in life which were brought on by Adam, as opposed to Satan. Adam let him in. We know that uh, Eve was there. She was to blame. But the Bible puts the blame on Adam in the book of Romans. And it calls it Adam's sin. So we know that the devil works because man let him in. But there are times when he comes in illegally. When you have been baptized in the name of Jesus because you have repented of your sins, you've been baptized for the remission of your sins. And when you have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is Jesus and John called it, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There is no distinction anywhere in Scripture between the infilling of the Holy Ghost and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There is nothing said in the, in the Bible except to say that the baptism and the infilling of the Holy Ghost are one and the same. Anybody saying anything else is parsing and dividing and mixing and adding to Scripture all at once. They're lying to you. If you've been baptized with the Holy Ghost, you've been baptized in the name of Jesus, you have received the two sides of, of the same coin. That is the baptism into Christ. You've been baptized into Christ in His blood and His Spirit for the remission of your sins in water because you truly believed in Jesus and repented of your sins. And you've been baptized in the Spirit, speaking with tongues according to the Scripture, is the evidence, not because someone taught you, not because you already knew how to speak it, but because the power of the Holy Ghost came on you to give you something that no one could ever take away from you. That is, something happened to me that I cannot explain. And it made me feel different. And it wasn't so much an emotional feeling. Yes, it is good emotionally. But something happened inside of me. And I can only describe it as like a, a fire that came up within my chest. And it came out my mouth. And my mind was overcome. And I was forever changed. That's a baptism if I've ever heard of a baptism in my life. Right. Praise God. People like to say baptism of fire is when you go through a hard time. When you first start out something. That's not what baptism of fire means. Baptism by fire is good, not, ne not negative. <laughs> it's positive. When you have received those things, the Bible teaches us in the, Rome, in the book of Romans, chapter 6, and in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, you have received the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It doesn't just stand beside you and sneak into you. You get experiences that come from God to help you know that it actually happened. Those are things that are established events in your life. That are landmarks, Brother Sonny. Amen. Landmarks. I remember when my burdens rolled away. It was October 4th, 1983, in Beckle Springs, Tennessee. It was a Thursday night, and the preacher preached. And, and Gladys, and Sister Young, and Brother Young, and my brother and my mother went back into the prayer room so that I could concentrate a little better. Because I wasn't receiving it. And in the dark prayer room with the door, letting in a little bit of light, I, I released everything within me that I understood at age seven, almost, or age eight, almost nine. I released everything within me, and I surrendered to Jesus. And I began to speak in a language that I didn't understand. It seemed like baby talk. There's no, it's not a coincidence that it sounds like that when we were first born again. Praise the Lord. When that happened to me, and when it happened to you, God put a legal barrier around you. Legal meaning the law. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Amen. The Holy Ghost gives us the moral code of the law. It makes us not want to hurt people. It makes us not want to commit adultery. It makes us not want to lie and cheat and steal and take our neighbor's goats, camels, donkeys, or otherwise servants. But the criminal code of the law, you're going you're gonna to be banished from the people. You're going to be stoned. You're going to be killed, etc., etc., etc. And the moral uh, or, or the sacrificial code of the law, kill this turtle dove, kill this lamb, kill this bullock, etc. Those are found in Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So we receive both. Of those, of those parts of the law, that which is in Jesus Christ, and that moral code of the law, which is still important that we listen to the Ten Commandments. Amen? We receive all of that when we get Jesus. Amen? And so there's a legal barrier around us that Satan is not allowed to cross. But here's the problem. Satan has no moral character. Jesus said you were a murderer from the beginning. What do you, what do you mean from the beginning? It means he murdered 
the eternal existence of one third of the angels with an intent to murder the creation that he knew God was going to do. And he's been murdering and lying. He's a liar. He does not have the ability to tell the truth. And so sometimes, most of the time, the blood protects us as long as we're living right. If we're, if we're not living right, we make a little entryway, a little gate in the blood for him to come in. But if we're living right, most of the time the blood protects us. But sometimes God sees a man like Job and says, I love you and I want to test you. So I'm going to let the devil cross this barrier because I know he'll do it if I give him permission. And it's only done to make us stronger. So sometimes the devil attacks. I said all that to set a theological basis and help you to understand why Satan attacks the people of God. Most of the time it's not the devil, but sometimes you'll feel it. There'll be things happening that just don't make sense. Amen. The Bible tells us in Matthew 4 and 1, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So his desert retreat was not a vacation. His purpose was to be tested through prayer, fasting, and through the manifold temptations of Satan and time alone with God. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. I always read that wrong, but when I was studying this, I saw that the scripture says, The crown of life. It's not just, Sister Jackie, he's not just going to give you some crown that's all tarnished up, lay it around in the closet. He's going to give you the one that says, Said Jackie. Ever since you were baptized in Jesus' name, baptized with the Holy Ghost, the one that says, Alan. He's going to give you your crown of life. Right? Praise God. If you endure temptation, that means get through it and die and go on to heaven or, or go up in the rapture. You're going to have to get through the whole life. The whole life is a temptation. Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. God doesn't cause temptations towards sin, but he does allow tests and trials to refine us. He wants to make us pure gold. To my wife's wedding ring in because it over time it, it was its design had has two twisted pieces of gold in order to join an engagement band and a wedding band and we bought it at service merchandise and I paid as much as I could in layaway anybody remember layaway <laughs> because I was a poor college student and uh, Mary Powell Rachel's grandmother went in without telling me and paid the rest of it and so uh, one third of it was paid for by Mary, and I really appreciate that. It was it, it's made of gold, and it has two little diamonds and one little diamond uh, that's not as little as the others. It was only three hundred eighty-five dollars plus tax. That was a long time ago. It was nineteen ninety-one to be exact when I or nineteen ninety-three to be exact when I questioned. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to be exact, when I first put it on layaway at service merchandise and now defunct department store. Um, and uh, we went in to Zales, which I don't recommend. If you're going to go to anyone, go to Chilson. He's a good guy in downtown Cambridge. But we went into Zales and they quoted us a massive amount of money to have it repaired, uh, which he did it for $55. As opposed to 800. Bless him. Bless him. Amen. In Jesus' name for being an honest businessman. And uh, But they told us, Zales, you, you won't find this kind of gold anymore unless you pay a lot of money. They said, we're not getting good gold anymore. And I was fascinated by that. We're getting cheap gold. He said, you can tell, because you know, a gemologist and someone that understands gold, metallurgist, they're going to be able to tell. And they said, uh, even though this is just 14 karat gold, it's a high quality gold that was much more prevalent uh, in the 90s. And, but nowadays, you, you've got to pay uh, closer to $10,000 to get this kind of gold. $385, so it's $385. <laughs> Amen. It, it is okay to say cha-ching. <laughs> God wants to refine us. He wants to refine us. There's more gold in the world than ever before, but it's not all good gold. And that's inflation and all kinds of stuff and the reason that it's caused. God wants to refine us. 
He allows tests and trials in our lives. Sometimes these tests are from Satan with the intent that we might glorify God through our lives. The glory of God is magnificent in our lives, like that beautiful gold when we defeat the devil. <laughs> it is magnificent. We shine forth like the one, that, that ring that you put in the jewelry cleaner and agitate it and it comes out and it's beautiful. It is a glorious thing to defeat the devil. Amen? And Christ in us defeats the devil because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen? Oh, John said to the angel, who are these people? And he said, you know who they are. <laughs> they are the ones who have come through great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They are white and brilliant. The scripture talks about the white of the spiritual realm as being like no fuller on earth. You know a, if you know what a fuller is, it's not just a last name. It's someone who had the ability through uh, apothecary-like methods to use chemicals to wash things. They had fullers. They've had fullers for 6,000 years. People using uh, bicarbonate of soda or uh, different types of calcifications to wash things and to make them white. And the, the heavens are glorious with the white robes of the righteous people of God because they have defeated Satan. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And just like that gold, it is brilliant. The Bible says everybody needs to be glad and rejoice because the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know what the white wedding dress represents? It's very religious. It represents purity. And that is physical purity of the bride. The fine linen, the Bible says, is the righteousness of the saints. Praise God. So Jesus was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be refined by the Father by using the devil. That's not nice. It hurts. The Bible says in Luke 4 that Jesus was 40 days tempted of the devil. So it's also repeated in the book of Mark that he was in the wilderness 40 days tempted of Satan. So we know that Jesus was not just tempted in a 15 minute span of time when the devil moved him all over the world from the pinnacle of the temple to stones being made bread to uh, to the highest mountain in the world which we, sounds like he took him to Everest and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in one moment of time. That's not the temptation of Satan. That's when the devil appeared to him. But he tempted him for 40 days. Jesus had a purpose and it was the refining of the saints. The Lord has a purpose for allowing the devil to enter into our lives and that is refining. So I'm doing a little preaching and a little teaching today. Stay with me. I won't take, I hope not to take more than, okay, I'm not even going to promise. Right? I don't want to lie in the house of God. Forgive me. The Bible says in Hebrews 2, 18, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted, which means he's able to help us. So because of his victory, he can assist us effectually through our temptations. His victory, his victory translates into our lives and in the life of every believer who would receive him and walk in him. Because the Bible tells us in James that if we submit ourselves to God, if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. And so the best way to war against him is to resist him. Sometimes we have to pull out the sword and fight him. But that's the only offensive weapon. In the armor of light, in the armor of God, the only offensive weapon is the sword. It's the word of God and prayer. The Bible says they're both the sword. The word of God, and then it says praying always. So, that's all we have. We don't have a spear. We don't have a virgin catapult. We don't have a battering ram cannon. Davis Pedigo used to sing, the weapons we use are not bombs and guns. Worship is the way that the battle is won. Praise God. If you don't know who Davis Pettigo was, look him up. The music is awesome. And so we have defensive weapons mostly. So standing our ground is the best way to defeat the devil. Matthew 4 and 2, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, only Moses and Elijah did this, by the way, other than Jesus. And when the, afterward he was in hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written, praise God, amen. Speak the word, folks. Memorize it if you can, but write it down. Keep a, keep a pocket Bible on you. 
Your, use your Bible app judiciously. Let it overcome your phone with the Bible. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Jesus was loosing the power of the Father in his physical weakness, because I don't know about you, I'm weak after fasting one day. I've never tried adding the other 39, and I probably never will. Jesus was physically weak. The devil was preying upon his specific weakness, which was hunger, and hunger to the point of insanity. Playing to the weakness of his flesh and preying upon the weakness of his flesh. So um, at the same time, the devil was preying on, on him like a predator. And he was also playing to him like, hey, check this out. <clears throat> it was a fast food, fast food solution to the problem of the, the flesh. And Jesus was done with his fast. He was going to eat later that day anyway. And that's what the devil will do when he comes and attacks us. He will give us a solution to a problem that God's about to fix anyway. Don't listen to him, folks. Don't listen to him. It's a big lie. It's all smokescreen. <coughs> the Bible says, don't say that you're tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So the Bible says that we are tempted when we're drawn away. We do not, we, we don't have the ability to say, like Flip Wilson used to say in his comedy routine, the devil made me do it. We don't have the ability to say that because the devil didn't make us do anything. We, in ourselves, have culpability and responsibility for giving into temptation. We are not responsible for being tempted. That's not a sin. But we are tempted to sin. And when we commit that sin, then we are culpable. Then we are responsible. So if you are putting yourself in a situation for temptation, that's on you. But if you're living your life, and I'm living my life for God, and the temptation comes, I do not need to feel condemned. But when I'm drawn away of that own desire within me, and when I go and I say, I am, as a matter of fact, going to rob the savings and loan. There's no more savings and loan. I just dated myself. I am going to rob that bank. I want to be like Jesse James. I want to have the life of Billy the Kid. And I need some money right now. So I'm going to commit this perjury, which is going to lead me to embezzlement. And I'm going to do this because I desire this thing. And I know that I'll never get caught. Well, we know, first of all, my problem is that I might not get caught on this earth, but God sees me. That's my own lust and my own desire for a fast food solution instead of praying. You'd be surprised how often people equate money with prayer. You'd be surprised how many times, and I appreciate, I, I need, when I've entered into this missions thing, I need people to give and help. But you'd be surprised how many times I've asked people Pray for me. And they'll say, well, I can't give right now. I really meant prayer. I honestly meant prayer. I need prayer more than anything else. God will provide. I need people to pray for me. But people love to have a solution that involves dollars and cents. I know because I'm a human being. Sometimes the solution does not involve a quick answer. Sometimes the solution is going to be answered right away and it will be quick. But whether God takes time to do it through a process or God does it immediately, the devil will offer a fast food solution. And eating fast food is interesting and fun to do once a week. Okay? But if we do it all the time, there's going to be a problem. This guy made this documentary, Super Size Me, in which he ate three times a day food from fast food. It was supposedly supposed to prove that fast food is bad for us all the time. The problem is there's only a very small fraction, like less than one-tenth of a percent of anywhere in the world where people eat fast food three times a day. Yeah. And most people know that they're eating. So it didn't really prove anything, except that he was uh, offering up an opportunity for him to give himself a heart attack. So most people understand that eating fast food three times a day is a bad idea. And that in moderation, okay. I was raised to believe that, I was raised by a nurse, I was raised to believe that McDonald's was bad for me. And so, 
Uh, we had never had Hostess cupcakes. We never had pop. Sorry, it was soda in my house. You gotta forgive me. Actually, no, it was Coke. If it was Pepsi, it was Coke. If it was Sprite, it was Coke. We never had any of that in my house. I went over to my friend's house and I thought, this is heaven on earth. You mean you have ding dongs in your pantry all the time? This is amazing. I want to spend the night with you every Friday night. But I was raised to believe that the solution to eating right was mom's cooking and mom cooks well. The devil will always provide you a way to get around God's process. But it's going to destroy you because you can't eat, you can't receive that all the time. But God's word is good bread. It's whole grain bread. It's good for your body. It's good for your soul. It gives you what you need. Some protein and some carbs and some fiber and everything that you need. And it takes time to study the word of God. It takes time to receive the word of God. And Jesus knew that. And so he answered him. I'm telling you today, you can defeat temptation. Amen? You can defeat temptation. Matthew 4, 5 through 6. The devil decided to change his tack. He said, then the, the Bible says, then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, so Jerusalem, and setteth him, on, setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. So there they are, two spiritual beings, one of them in physical form and one of them in spiritual form, on the top of a pinnacle of Herod's temple. I wonder if anybody saw them. And saith unto him, if thou be the Son of God, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt thou dash thy foot against the stone. So the devil quotes, the devil realizes that Jesus is just going to quote the scripture. So he decides to quote the scripture too. The devil will quote scripture to you. He will say all kinds of foolish things to you like, you need to not go to that church where those people don't do this and don't do that and dress like that because they're all judgmental and the Bible says God don't look on the outward appearance, he looks on the heart. He just twisted the scripture, which first of all was talking about David's brothers and second of all, that translated is better as God doesn't look at the eyes. He doesn't judge people by who they think they are, he judges people by what's in their heart. And so that's a twisting of the scripture that I've been heard, I've heard used all my life about why you shouldn't come to an apostolic Pentecostal church. Because you know these people here are not judgmental. You know you feel the love of God when you come into the house of the Lord. You know the people love you here. You see, the devil will use the Bible. If you try to use it against him, he'll use the Bible. But you've got to know more than just how to quote it. You've got to know what it means. So Jesus said unto him, it is written again. <laughs> I'll take your scripture and I'll raise you a scripture. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. In other words, I shouldn't be jumping down off of this and committing virtual suicide just so the angels will raise me up because I don't want to tempt God and put him in a situation like that. And I know that I shouldn't commit suicide because I shouldn't murder myself. Jesus offered glamour. It would have been glamorous. Someone said, I don't know, but someone said, historically speaking, in one of the years around when this might have happened, at Jesus' age, someone had committed suicide from the pinnacle of the temple. And it was noised abroad. And so this would have, this was a good idea by the devil if that actually happened. It would have dovetailed with press, and they would have said, oh, Jesus jumped, and he lived, and the angels raised him up. So, so Satan tempted him based on his identity. The devil's going to tempt you based on your identity. If thou be the Son of God. The question here was, did Jesus know who he was? The question here is, did he understand that he had no need to prove himself to Satan? Another question is, Jesus knew that he had no need to prove himself that way to the people. Because he was going to prove himself in other ways. Jesus did have a need to prove himself to the people. But not that way. The Bible says it over and over and over again. He did miracles out of compassion and to prove who he was. He fed the 5,000 to prove who he was and because he felt like they needed to eat. And so, the other question is, did Jesus understand the nature of this deception? Satan knew who Jesus was. Satan was not afraid of who Jesus, uh, or of, afraid of tricking people into uh, thinking who Jesus was because he didn't want people to know who Jesus was. So Satan understood who Jesus was or else he wouldn't have wasted his time 
to come and tempt him. He wouldn't have been messing with him in the first place. So Satan knew who Jesus was. He still knows who Jesus is. And if you have Jesus inside of you, he knows who you are. So he should be intimidated of you and not you of him. The devil is nothing but a bully. And I never would do what bullies told me to do. I never would on the playground. I never would. And I got beat up a few times for it. But I never would do what they told me to because I couldn't stand that. One time I had to go tell my brother about these two guys. And my brother went mental on them in the woods. And they came out of the woods crying because they, they had me backed up against a tree and told me I had to eat an ant. And they really did. As this was Texas, so I had to eat fire ants. And made me cry and I went running, running. They were just being bullies. And I went and told John. And John went out on these with these really awesome bike trails on somebody else's property. And I stood outside the woods and he backed them up against the tree. He didn't touch them. But he said something to them and I to this day don't know what he said to them. But they came out of the woods and one of them, well I won't tell you, but one of them lost control of something. Uh, I'm not kidding. They came out of the woods crying and bawling. The devil is just a bully. You got to stand up to him and if you have not the wherewithal, the intestinal fortitude to stand up to the devil in that moment. And that's okay. You need to get some help. And that help comes from Jesus. Yes. And the power of God will help you remember who you are. Yes. And he'll back you up. Praise God. Yes. Quote the scripture against him. And when he comes back with the Bible deception, you go back at him with more truth. Yes. Do you know who you are? Did Jesus know his own spiritual authority? Well, the proof is in the pudding. Jesus is proved here to have known his own spiritual authority. Yes. I'll make you the center of attention. Then you'll be able to do God's work and you'll really know you're the Messiah. And everybody else will know you're the Messiah. Oh, yeah. One compromise. That's okay. Yes, but it's a necessary compromise, Jesus, and you'll understand. Don't read the fine print. Just, just sign right here and we'll get this false suicide over with. And the angels, they're waiting. They'll take care of you. It'll all, it'll all be okay. <laughs> don't, don't read. Don't read it. Don't read. Don't worry about that. This is a chance to test God, Jesus. Let's test Him right here and right now. High stakes, high pressure. It's like signing up for a free gym membership, <laughs> which is never free. It's like a used car purchase for a jalopy that you know is going to break down, but you feel the pressure and you feel the need to please that salesperson. This is the devil. It was, Jesus, this is your chance to prove yourself to Israel. It's a fast track to the power of the cross, and you won't have to go through the cross. I won't mess with Pilate or Herod. There'll be no beatings. There'll be no carrying the cross. There'll be no blood. You'll have everything, and everybody's going to love you, and you'll be a superstar. It's a fast track. See, this is a fast food solution. Matthew 4, 8 through 9. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, I have had enough. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Have you ever heard anybody say, Oh, Grandma wouldn't suffer fools easily. Anybody ever heard that said about somebody? She didn't suffer fools. He didn't suffer fools. Amen. There's a time when We've got to say, okay, enough is enough. And in Carmen's second big hit album in 1981, I think it was, going way back into the groove yard of Forgotten Hits. <laughs> Anybody remember Carmen? Mm -hmm. It was uh, the album where he had the, the black and blue shirt on and the leather jacket that was called Coming On Strong. He had a real good song back when Christian music was actually about Jesus. And the song was called Get Out of My Life. And you need to look it up. It's just, he's just rebuking the devil in three verses. Yeah. And he said, hey, I'm coming, you've, I've told you once, I've told you twice in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of my life. Yeah. And me and my nephew Lawrence and my nephew Lyndon used to put it on an LP uh -huh. in my sister's house. And we would run around the living room rebuking the devil <laughs> and dancing. That's a good song. Get out of my life. Jesus said, I've had enough. Get out of my life. 
the devil said, and it, he is recorded as to have said in Luke 4, everything that I'm promising you is delivered unto me. And the scriptures state that he was technically correct. He, would, he is the prince of the power of the air. He has the power to give kingdoms and take away kingdoms for a time. But God is above that because we, got, we know that God is the king of kings and lord of lords. Uh, and God does that as well. God has the power to circumvent everything Satan does. Satan is in control of our world right now. He's in control of the news waves. He's in control of kingdoms of this world. He's in control of the public health system of our world. He's in control of the politics of the Western civilization especially. And we see corruption everywhere. That's delivered unto him. And so in other words, he's saying, I can, I can deliver on what I'm promising, Jesus. All shall be thine. The Bible says in time past, in Ephesians 2 and 2, we also walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You see, the world listens to that prince. We listen to another prince. We listen to the prince of peace. The world listens to temptation. So if we fill our lives with the voices of this world, then we're going to believe I, I went in, my, my phone didn't work recently, so I went into T-Mobile and I said, I just can't seem to connect. And they said, it's probably your antenna. And I never even thought that because cellular technology and digital technology is basically just radio waves. This is just this is similar technology to the AM radios that people used to carry around in the late 40s and 50s listening to them. It still has an antenna. And she said, the problem is your antenna is not connecting with the network. That's the same thing. What are you tuned into to listen to? If you fill your life with Jesus, you're going to be fine-tuned to hear the voice of God. Jesus had been listening to the Father for 40 days and 40 nights, and so he didn't believe the, the voice of the children of disobedience. Jesus knew that his promise was, Isaiah said, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain." For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The devil was offering him a fast track, not only to Messiah, to be king of the whole earth. He was offering him this fast track. But Jesus knew that it has to happen according to the Father's process. I've come the first time. I've got to have a death, burial, and resurrection experience. I've got to go into the grave. I've got to ascend on high, then I've got to come back again. And that's how it's got to happen. Jesus towards the end of his ministry, said of the devil in John 14 and 30. And I want you to hear this right now as I wrap this up. I want you to hear John 14 and 30. I want you to feel this scripture right now. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. That's powerful. What does that mean? Jesus said, the prince of this world is coming and he's going to be more manifest in the time leading up to the crucifixion. He's going to be more manifest in my trial. One of you is going to betray me. Another one of you is a devil. It's going to be rough for a while. The prince of this world is going to be more manifest. This is what happens in the great tribulation at the end. The Bible alludes to a three and a half year period and a three and a half year period. Two three and a half year periods leading up to the coming of the Lord. The prince of this world will be more manifest. And Jesus said, he's going to be more in my life and more in your life than he was, he has been. He's had to stay away for a little over three years. But I'm not worried about it. I just won't be spending as much time with you as I did. Because the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. What Jesus was saying is, he has no power over me. The prince of this world is coming and he has no hooks in me. Praise God. The prince of this world is coming and because I've been living right, because I've been victorious over sin, because I have felt the pain of temptation, but I've not given in to temptation. He has no hold on me. Praise God. There are no chinks in my armor. I'm going to willingly take off my armor and let him kill me. But he's not going to win. He thinks he's going to win, but he knows nothing. Praise the Lord. I'm talking today about when the devil leaves. He thinks he's going to win, but he knows nothing because the devil lives in his own reality. And if you know anything about reality, you know that you can't create your own reality. 
It is what it is. That's the greatest wisdom that ever came from Minnesota. I never heard that term until I came up here. And I like it because it helps people live their lives and live them right. Accept some things that you can't deal with. It is what it is. The devil thinks that he can create his own reality and become his own Messiah and save the world. He is what he is. He's going to attack. It's going to happen. But Jesus is also who he is. And he has all power in heaven and earth. said. He thinks he created his own reality, but all he's created is his own deception. Jesus said, ain't no devil holding on to me. He's got nothing in me. He has lost. He doesn't know it yet, but he's lost and he's lost big. He's lost all and he doesn't even know it. The Bible says, we were in time past walking like the children of disobedience. We had by nature the children of wrath. We were the children of wrath. But Ephesians 2 and 4 says, but God. Everybody say, but God. but God, none of us would be here today but for God. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. Praise God. By grace are you saved. By grace are you saved. By grace are you saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're seated in him. We are seated in Him. It's future, but it's actually now. Because the Bible talks about heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we're seated with Him. We're going to reign with Him. We're reigning spiritually. We're going to reign literally someday. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us when Jesus uh, had done with Satan, He rebuked him. Uh, and in Matthew 4 and 11, Then the devil leaveth him. And behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. You see, Jesus was ready. He was ready to begin. Amen? Amen. So this was not the, the end. This was the beginning. What was Jesus ready to begin? Jesus was ready to begin his ministry. He was ready to go to the next level. Everybody say, I'm ready to go to the next level. Don't say it if you don't mean it. Why was Jesus ready? Because he stood up to Satan for 40 days and nights of bullying and temptations. Because he had fasted and prayed. Praise God. Because he spoke back to Satan with the word. Satan was like, don't back talk me, boy. My dad said that to me. My mom said that to me. And I deserved it. <laughs> Every time. Jesus was like, in the words of Carmen, I'm going to quote Carmen again. You may remember in one of Carmen's, said, one of Carmen's songs called The Champion. Jesus told the devil, you shut your face. I wrote the book. <laughs> Jesus came right back with the word of God in the same way he had quoted the scripture to those temple scribes and Pharisees at 12 years old. But this time he was more mature and every time he spoke it, he didn't have to shout it. He just spoke it and the devil shivered <laughs> and he was afraid, praise God, because Jesus was the manifestation of the Father and he did in fact write the book. Jesus did not answer devil, the devil's temptations with sin, but with resistance, praise the Lord. Because he stood firm in his own position. Because he was on God's side, his position was always right. If you're on God's side, your position will always, always be right. Jesus was ready to go to the next level because Jesus told the devil to leave. You have the power to tell the devil to leave. Jesus was ready to see his mission through to its successful completion. And I know that Jesus was ready to help us. And he is ready to help us today. Because the scripture says in that he was tempted. He's able to help those that are tempted as well. Jesus took on his full spiritual authority. See, he was baptized and immediately he was driven into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. Praise the Lord. When this happened, Jesus began his ministry. Shortly thereafter was his time. To gather his disciples, his time at Cana of Galilee, his time to do the works of the Lord. And when you resist temptation, when the devil leaves, you're going to find that you have new spiritual authority. You're going to have to find that you have new power in the Lord. Because the devil is afraid. When the devil attacks you, it's because he's intimidated by you. Because he sees something in you that will not compromise. You can't be bought. You can't be bribed. And you can't be beaten. 
When the devil leaves, the temptation stops. The storm is over. I said when the devil leaves, the temptation stops. The storm is over. When the devil leaves, you may still feel weary. You may still feel exhausted, frustrated, and hungry. It may still smell like rain. It may still look like rain. But the sun is just over that cloud's line and hallelujah. I wish all my, 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 oh, I feel, I feel a helper today, praise God. The birds may not have come back from the storm, but you'll hear them soon, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Praise the Lord, there's a dove coming with an olive branch in her mouth to the window of your ark. You're going to be all right, no matter what it looks like now, know this, that the storm has stopped, and you need to recognize the fact that if you know it in your heart, and it doesn't look like it around you need to go ahead and celebrate your victory. You need to live like you believe it. Because when the devil leaves, the storm is over. Hallelujah. The devil only leaves a born again saint of God, Brother James, one way. There's only one way that he leaves. He runs. He runs. He runs. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. There's only one way the devil leaves. He flees. And he doesn't flee because he's in a marathon and he's trying to get in shape. He flees because it is inconvenient for him to flee. And he's got to get out of there. He's got to get away. He's going to keep losing his power. And other people are going to see his loss in your life. And so he doesn't want to be around the victorious saint of God very long because he knows your witness is going to reach other people. He goes because he has to flee if you resist him. Because he has been defeated by Jesus Christ in you. The devil leaves because the word has power over him. I don't care who you are. You can understand the basic precepts of the word of God. You come to church to get the deeper stuff. And I'm going to keep preaching the basics as long as I can. And I'm going to give you the deep stuff on Wednesday nights. But you can understand the word of God for yourself. And you can quote it against the devil. Amen. And you can have authority over him. Amen. The devil leaves because you refuse to answer his temptation with sin. When you did all you could, you just stood. Hallelujah. The devil leaves because when you did all you could, you just said, okay, forget it. You go ahead and punch me all you want to. I'm not moving out. And you can't make me move. You can throw me in prison. You can make me sick. But you cannot make me move. Hallelujah. The Bible says when you've done all to do, stand against the wiles of the devil. Just stand. You made it to another level. When the devil leaves, the angels are going to come and minister to you. And those stones that are lying at your feet that you stubbed your toe on, that he said, well, if you would have made them bread, you wouldn't have stubbed your toe. God's going to move those rocks out of your way. And he's going to feed you with manna from heaven. And finally, stand with me right now. When the devil leaves, you're free to go. When the devil leaves, you're free to move forward. When the devil leaves, those hindrances are gone. I know that things are difficult right now. I understand it because I'm, I'm living with you right now in the same situation. It's difficult. And there are so many unknowns. But I want you to know that everything in this world that's happening right now that seems to be attacking people, attacking churches, is orchestrated by the enemy himself. And the only way we're going to make it is by walking in the Spirit. The only way Jesus made it was by being strong in the Lord. That's why you need to sign up and fulfill it. Your promise to fast in one way or the other. Fast. Push aside the plate for a predetermined uh, time period. You need to pray. You need to get into Jesus. The only way we're going to make it, the only way anybody's going to make it, is when we're staying in Jesus and standing against the devil. You've got to make it in your mind, according to the scripture, that you love not your life unto death. That you trust in Jesus above all things. You trust in Jesus above people. I trust Jesus more. I trust you folks, and I love you, but I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I trust Jesus more than anybody in this world. 
I trust Jesus. He's going to take us through. And if I have to do it alone, some people have had their families taken from them. Some people have been thrown in prison. People have been persecuted. All kinds of things have happened for the last 2,000 years. But they're the ones that love not their lives unto death are the ones that are going to stand before the throne. And there's not going to be any tempter there. And there's not going to be any shadows there. And there's not going to be any night there. And there's only going to be Jesus. I want us to take this altar service right now. And I just want to proclaim the victory. I, want, I would like to ask you to come down. And if you can stand... I would like to ask you to stand and raise your hands and just praise Jesus for the victory. I just want today to be a day of praise. This morning, I want to take our altar service and just give the Lord the praise for victory. You say, Brother Bush, the victory has not come and my prayer has not been answered. Praise Him anyhow. 